If you watch feeding of the fish with the naked eye, it seems that nothing unusual is happening. But as soon as you see this process at the speed of thousands of frames per second, it becomes obvious. The fish does not just catch food. It sucks it in like a vacuum cleaner. I wonder, what are the mechanics of this process? When the fish's mouth is closed, the pressure inside is low. But as soon as it opens up the mouth sharply and widely, the water rapidly fills the mouth and carries the prey with it. The only thing left to do is to swallow it and let the water out through the gills. This way of eating is typical for a whole variety of fish species. And it doesn't matter whether they suck food from the bottom or from the surface or while it's sinking to the bottom. By the way, if the food is not to its taste, the fish can do this. The main food of these fish is detrius. Dead organics on the bottom of the reservoir, not always edible, hence such pickiness. The fish first takes the food and then decides whether to swallow or not. These movements that look like the fish chewing are actually a process of determining edible and inedible particles. That is, it actually has a whole bioplant there working to determine these flavors, smells, nutritional content in the mouth. It seems that we've forgotten something. Well, of course, how do predators feed? The mandarin fish, or Chinese perch, a dreadful predator. And the Chinese perch is not only carnivorous, it's a cannibal. Having hatched from eggs, it devours its siblings for competitive reasons. The Chinese perch preys from ambush. It targets, leaps forward, and sharply swallows the prey. Taking a huge swallow of air with the fish, it partially sort of sucks in the fish at the same time it grabs it with the mouth. Well, again, depending on the size. That is, if the size of the victim is large enough, then it grabs it with the mouth. If the victim is small enough, it simply swallows it with water. The Chinese birch drains excess water through the gills. By the way, without this, it would have a recoil effect, as in the case of a shot. Filling the mouth, the water moves forward by inertia. And if it wasn't released through the gills in time, the predator would be thrown back. The black panther. Who doesn't know or hasn't seen this animal? In zoos like here, or in movies, cartoons. For instance, Bagheera from Mowgli is a panther. And now probably many will be surprised when I say that there is no such animal in nature. There is no black panther, and in general, never has been. The astonishment will probably be even greater when I announce one more fact. This is not a panther, and yet it's a panther. So what is the tricky part? Let's sort it out. If you look at some black panthers close up, you'll see black spots visible on their coat. This is the answer to why there is no such animal. Actually, the panther is not a separate species of animals, it's a genus, which includes four living species. The tiger, lion, leopard, and the jaguar. They all belong to the genus panther. This is their common name. The black color is just a black color. 
like people, have blondes and brunettes. These animals can have fair-colored individuals and dark-colored ones. Black jaguars and leopards are not the only ones of their kind. Dark color is found in all biological species, from mollusks to chimpanzees. Such individuals are called melanistic animals due to the excess of the pigment melanin. To make it clearer, these brunettes are the exact opposite of light-colored albinos. Albinos are animals that have a mutation of albinism, as a result of which their body no longer synthesizes any pigment at all. And melanistic animals are also a mutation. When black pigment melanin is synthesized in excess, there can be very much of it. Then such animals are purely black, maybe a little less, then there is a mixture of black and red. Formally, both albinism and melanism are a deviation from the norm, an error in copying DNA. Just a second, but what is the norm? After all, the black raven, for instance, is a melanistic animal, by all indications, and a polar bear is an albino. However, for them, this color is common. Initially, the basis can be the same, a mutation. But when this mutation has entrenched and has become a characteristic of all animals of this species, it is sort of no longer a mutation, but a normal animal. Melanin is a universal natural coloring matter. This pigment colors animal hair, bird plumage, fish scales, plant and microorganisms tissues. We are no exception either. The color of our eyes, hair and skin depends on the concentration of melanin. By the way, suntan and freckles are also melanin. All vertebrates, including humans, have melanin-producing special cells, melanocytes, located in the lower layer of the skin. Outwardly, they resemble sea stars. How exactly melanocytes produce a pigment is not exactly known, but it is produced from an amino acid called tyrosine. Melanocytes process it into dense granules where the pigment binds to protein molecules and all this is injected into the upper layers of the skin, the hair and into the iris of the eyes. But still, why do, for instance, melanistic jaguars and leopards produce more pigment than most of their relatives? Can it work like this, for example, if a jaguar does not live in an open area, but somewhere in the jungle, where it is darker, where everything is duskier, then it produces this pigment in order to hide better, fade into the environment? Well, frankly, I doubt it, because cats mostly prey in the dark. It's twilight or pre-dawn hours. And in this case, it doesn't matter at all. A darker color or a lighter color, as long as they are not white. It may seem that melanism is such a joke of nature. But for many animals, this is a very useful quality. When there's a lot of melanin, then these animals are more resistant to stress. They are better at inactivating poisons. With respect to albinism, it is more difficult. They have no melanin. That is, they are less resistant to stress. Poisons affect them more severely. That is, it is therefore harmful. You must have heard that in the case of a nuclear explosion, only cockroaches will survive. 
This is, of course, doubtful. But the incredible variety of these insects is due, among other things, to the high concentration of melanin in the tissue. In addition, it protects against radiation quite well. It turns out that melanism is an experiment of nature, with the help of which it tries to adapt and preserve as many species as possible. Next in the program, incredible, beautiful, and frightening, eyes of animals. You cannot even guess whose eyes are these, or those. And are decorative pigeons a joke of nature or a fancy of man? Why do their breeds look so unnatural? We'll continue to explore the world of these anything but simple animals in a couple of seconds. out that the color of eyes of all living beings is determined by the pigment melanin. Yet the difference in the structure and capabilities of the organs of vision in humans and animals is immense. Many animals have round shapes of the pupil, just like humans. In this case, the eye, like a wide camera lens, perceives information from all sides. However, there are pupils of absolutely incredible shape. Try to guess what kind of animal is it? A hint, it has horns, hooves, and a beard. No, it's just a goat. And they've got such unusual pupils in their eyes because they are climbers. They are happy to jump onto cars. Well, what I mean is they have mastered the vertical so effectively, owing also to their eyes being able to scan the vertical. Now, if we look at this slit, it means that it reflects rays much better on the fundus. An elongated longitudinal pupil widens the field of vision. For example, in humans, it is about 160 degrees, and in horses, it is about 340. This is also necessary to be able to notice the danger in time. For the same reason, eyes of herbivores are located on the sides of the head and scan the space independently of each other. People in this regard are closer to predators. We more often see the object with two eyes jointly. This is useful as humans are more often interested in the size of the object and how far it is. Predators estimate the size and distance to the object too in order to understand whether it is worth preying on it or not. You can easily recognize the owner of these eyes, the cat. Why are their eyes like that? Well, first of all, pupils, of course. The pupils in a cat narrow very effectively because the cat's eyes are very light sensitive. A cat often preys in the twilight and it needs to find prey in this semi-darkness. If we give it illumination good enough, then the pupils narrow down as much as possible because, well, roughly speaking, in order to not burn the film, or matrix. By the way, in daylight, cats can see 90% worse than humans. That is, visiting an eye physician, they would only see the top line of the table. But in the dark, their eyesight is six times sharper than ours. But this is not the most interesting invention of nature. Whose do you think this eye is? The correct answer is cuttlefish. Its pupil is not only narrow and expands, it changes its shape. I think that such an active visual position might be connected with its way of protection when it releases the ink. 
and everyone can't see anything in this ink. Maybe it continues to see it right because it has such a large and active pupil. However, perhaps it's the chameleon who has the most mobile eyes. They can look in different directions independently of each other. As a result, the chameleon has a complete field of vision. Well, it's an analogy of what we see in security systems when one monitor receives information from several cameras. And it's not mobility of the pupil, but of the eyeball itself. It comes out of the orbit and the muscles turn towards the object of interest to the chameleon. Next in the final part, nature would have never been able to make such a bird breed. They're invented by man, but how and why? The next part of these anything but simple animals in a couple of seconds. what a pigeon looks like. You might wonder, what kind of question is this? Who hasn't seen these birds? Well, you probably haven't seen these. These are decorative pigeons. Here is a breed called the pouter pigeon. And here's the ice pigeon, which is called the statuesque pigeon in Russian. As you might guess, it has a special posture. The head of this bird should be flush with the tail. Or this one, a fantail breed. And that's true, there is something similar. Of course, this is not a creation of nature, but a miracle of selection. Yet when you look at such birds, the question arises, why are they bred? It's beauty. It's pure beauty and only for beauty. These pigeons are kept only for beauty. They are not flying birds, they don't fly. They live in dovecoats, they, in the wild. They don't see the sky. They won't survive in the wild. They won't survive. In the wild, they'll be eaten at once. Cannot find any food, no water, nothing. They are already used to being fed by the owner. Water, everything will be fine and wonderful. How do such decorative breeds appear? Birds are interbred until a stable sign appears. The selection of one breed takes 10 years on average. And somehow, it doesn't even fit into my head that all these incredible birds have a common ancestor, a wild dove. You take a usual old breed, up to even just a wild dove, as the blood is strong, as the immune system is very strong, and you begin to experiment on it. First you interbreed it with a white pigeon, then the children are, are interbred, that's parallel interbreeding. When the breed is sealed, it shouldn't be interbred so as not to spoil it. That's one of the reasons why dovecoats are divided into sections. Every section has its own purpose. Here we have a maternity section. Here is a breeding flock. Well, this analogy of a maternity hospital. If you draw an analogy between people and pigeons, it's a maternity hospital for pigeons. By the way, newborn pigeons are fed with bird's milk. It really exists. It is a mixture of fats, proteins, and minerals, which is produced in pigeon's craw, with both parents having it. After three weeks, the fledgling chicks are transferred to the next section. And here you have children's room. Well, that is sort of the youngsters are here. Yes, the young. Pigeons don't like cramped spaces, especially decorative ones. Each bird needs about a meter of personal space. Most pigeons begin to fly when they're a month old. By this time, they should be transferred to a section called pigeon run. What I mean is that from here, pigeons already fly outside. outside. 
but there, on the outside, they don't spend much time. As if following the saying, if you're well off, don't seek better. Pigeons prefer a warm dovecote, familiar roosts, and feeders with waterers to the open sky. Inventing and seeking unusual breeds of pigeons, humans actually imitate nature. He is a creator too. He can create unusual animals, breed something that has not been seen in the animal world. But the whole secret of nature is that it has more than enough curiosity in species not discovered yet. And in the species we know, there are still plenty of mysteries. Rather, on the contrary, nature is boundless and infinite, and we just have to decipher its separate rebuses. Behind them, of course, there will be new ones.